If I ask you to look at a $1 bill, and you looked at plenty of them, you haven't held on to a lot of them probably, but you looked at plenty of them, what would be the first thing you would tell me about what you know is on that dollar bill, the design of it? Would you tell me George Washington's picture's on there? Now what's on the other side? Would you tell me it has O-N-E on there? All right, what's on each side of that at each end of the bill? You see, we tend to focus on one aspect of something, and that's what we remember about it. But let's say in the case of a dollar bill, since that's my illustration, that's not the only thing on there. Back to my old talking about counterfeits. If you're going to know what a counterfeit is, you don't learn all the different counterfeits, all the mistakes they make. You learn what is really the genuine article. And that means you can't just start with one prominent part of it. You have to know all of it before you can really talk about the genuine article and say, here it is. But again, I say, we tend to focus on one aspect. And, and in people, we tend to look at one characteristic as we're dealing with other people. And it's whatever comes out that we tend to remember. And we may not know all there is, or we may not let our mind work the way it should in learning about all that there is about them. We do have this tendency to categorize people, to pick out a dominant trait. Uh, when people talk about God, when they're thinking about God, when they're thinking about the Holy Spirit, when they're thinking about Jesus, most of the time, like you remember Washington's picture in the center part of the one side of the dollar bill, you tend to think about only the love of God. And we've said enough of this pulpit and other pulpits and in writings to know even then they may not have the teaching of the Bible complete on their concept and forming their definition and viewpoint of the love of God. So many people, the love of God is some sort of sick, romantic uh, sentimentalism. And thus they attribute that to God. God is love. But people wish to believe that God is only love. Sort of like we're saved by faith. Well, we're not saved by faith only. We're saved by the blood of Christ. We're not saved by the blood of Christ only. We're saved by baptism. Well, we're not saved by baptism only. We're saved by repentance, but we're not saved by repentance only. And so people, when they think of God, they're going to zero in on what they've been taught, what they've heard, what they want to believe. And since the devil works so very hard on every individual, you can be sure that he's not going to teach you and lead you and guide you through the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, to understand the totality of the Bible's teaching on God being love. Same book that says God is love talks about the justice of God. The justice of God. One is just as important as the other. God is as just as He is love. This is what Paul said to the church at Rome in Romans 11, verse 22. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God. On those that fell... Severity. But toward you, goodness. Listen to the conditional promise here. If ye continue in his goodness, otherwise you also will be cut off. Now that's said to the Lord's church. Do you think the goodness of God is more important than the severity of God? Or the severity of God is more important than the goodness of God? Or that the goodness of God is in harmony with what you perceive is the love of God? And the severity of God is not in harmony with God is love? People want to see God as an indulgent grandparent or a parent. A being who never really scolds. 
anyone for anything and pretty much somebody you can talk out of anything you really want to do as so many children have learned to do with their weak need parents who really don't love them when they let them get by with things that are wrong when they refuse to rear them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord when they refuse to scripturally correct them they don't love them oh yes they say they do no you don't by the fruit you shall know them and by the fruit you will do what the Bible says and you don't love them yes but you have some sort of emotional syrupy feeling about them and that's the reason they can twist you around their little finger and get pretty much out of you whatever they want example of that go spend an hour in Walmart you don't have to do a whole big in-depth study just go to Walmart or someplace like that and watch the children and watch the parents and see what goes on as they pass the toys and the new cereal and whatever else it's not by accident I guarantee you it's not by accident that new things or at about eye level of the top of the shopping cart because that's where the little ones sit and then they turn around and look there it is right in their eyes good marketing that may be all it is they think of God as this indulgent parent never scolds that if he says something concerning what you must do or what you must not do well really does he mean it uh, does he really mean it I can talk him out of it uh, he shields people from every kind of discomfort. He pretty well gives them everything they want. That's pretty much the attitude and viewpoint people have of God. In Matthew 10 and verse 28, Jesus warned us concerning our need to fear God. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Well, is there anybody, Lord, we should fear? Yes, but rather fear him who's able to destroy both soul and body in hell. In America, people really don't fear much of anything except getting what they want, not being able to get what they want. Now, the picture of Jesus pretty much is the same as people's viewpoint and concept of God. He's pretty much portrayed, even painted in whatever people's concept of what he looked like, to look like this, as a quiet, uh, effeminate, uh, soft-spoken, docile, and harmless character. He's a, he's a good buddy who's always there to support you in whatever you decide to do or whatever you decide not to do. He's a friend to lean on no matter what happens, whether you're trying to study the Bible and live or whether you are got yourself in a big mess by making wrong choices contrary to what the Bible teaches. He's always there to say, feel good now. And we wonder where this feel-goodism comes from in the churches. Those who claim to follow Christ have done as much to put this idea of God, this false idea of God out there among those who claim to believe in Him and believe the Bible to be the Word of God and uh, believe in Christ their Savior. Just look round about. Look at the places that have folks running over themselves to get there by the thousands. And you'll see some sweet, sick preacher saying, God loves you. God doesn't want you to feel down and out. Feel good about yourself. You'll never hear them say, repent. Turn away from evil. You must obey the truth. You must change your lives to fit the teaching of the Bible. You must not learn to love the world and what love of it you have. You must give it up. You won't see that coming from them. You, if you do hear that much, it'll always be in generalities. But there won't be many specifics. And yet the Bible deals in specific, specific sins we commit that we must quit, whether they be sins of omission, things we ought to do, or sins of commission, things we should not do. When you find people like that, let me tell you what you ought to do. Or, and you don't have to just pick this passage. This is just a good example of other passages in the Bible like this. Don't read it to them themselves. They claim to believe in God. They claim to believe in Christ. They claim to believe the Bible's Word of God. They have this false concept of God in Christ. Have them read Matthew 7, 22 and 23, where Jesus gives us a picture of the judgment and what many are going to say to Him in that day. 
And he says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have we not cast out demons or devils? Have we not done many marvelous works in your name? Now watch his response going to be. Yes, little Johnny, you scream for three hours. We'll go back over and get the new box of cereal for you. I've told you no for the last 15 minutes. But okay, if it'll shut you up, we'll go ahead and give you the new box of cereal or the new tricycle or the new whatever it is. But Jesus says, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye who work iniquity or practice lawlessness. Now, you think there's going to be any comeback of anybody's part? Now, wait a minute, Lord, let's talk about this. I still might get the Cheerios, you see, if I can just argue. There's no argument ever pictured. There is no response by the Lord once he delivers that sentence to the people who deserve it. There's no indication, any preview Jesus gives of the coming judgment, that there's any comeback. Have you ever noticed this about God in the Old Testament and our Lord while he was on this earth? Any teaching about him? Have you ever noticed that Jesus doesn't say, Jeff, would you please do this for me? Have you ever noticed that? You'll never find that. Go read it and see. You'll never say, you'll never hear him say or read him say, or God saying, uh, I really wish you would do this. It'd make me feel so much better if you'd do it. It's not there. It's doing. And that's what you find. Period. It's just simply do it. Or not do it, as the case may be. Have you ever noticed that in reading your Bible? It's not hard to see. But it is not there. You say, well, I'm not so sure about that, preacher. You're fine. Read from Genesis Revelation as close as you can. As old brother Keeble used to say, it'll do you good. It doesn't. This Matthew 7, 22 through 23, and like passages... Uh, picturing Jesus' response to these people who said, Oh, we did all these marvelous things. We did it in your name. And he said, I don't even know you. It doesn't match their idea of God and Jesus. They don't want to do about it. In fact, you may see them get a bit puzzled. Because, you see, they're not studying the Bible much anyway. And they're listening to somebody else give them an idea of Christ that they like because it lets them do about anything they want to do. Throughout the denominational churches, this kind of thing's been going on for a long time. It's even worse now, and worse among some of them than certain others of them. But overall, that way of approaching thing is there. Uh, their aim is new miracle growth no matter what. So they avoid offending anybody. Well, you know, that gets interesting because nowadays every sin in the world is practiced by everybody all the way around. The government's saying that's all right and you're a nut if you oppose them. And you're politically incorrect if you oppose what's sinful. And so it's wide open to say anything you want to believe or do or not do, as long as it's against the Bible, pretty much, then feel good about it. God understands, after all, we're all sinners anyway, and we're all saved by the grace of God anyway. Do you mean to tell me you're perfect and don't have need of, of change and growth and development? Well, the very idea that you would tell me that I have to do this, that I must do that, and if I don't, I'm lost and can't go to heaven? And my response is, yes, I mean to tell you that because your Bible says it. You just won't believe it. There's the problem. We have develop this mindset that says yes I know this is God's word I know it says I must do that I understand what it says I ought to do I even understand how to do it it tells me that and maybe sometimes when to do it but <laughs> I really don't believe it I really think we can talk him out of it I really think, because of my concept, false concept, of what it means when the Bible says God is love, that I can just talk him out of it. Now understand, we're not saying God is not love. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8 makes it clear the very essence of the being of God is love. And it's made clear that He so loved us that He gave His only begotten Son. John 3, verse 16. And that Son said, when you've seen Me, you've seen the Father. Not the fleshly body I have, but in the way I live, the things I say, and the things I do. Now we're back to where the rubber meets the road. Because we just read you one of those things 
Jesus in the flesh said as a preview of the judgment. And those people who try to say, well, we did all these mighty works in thy name. They didn't do it. They were operating under some sort of idea that God's going to accept whatever we do because we're sincere in the doing of it. And Jesus said, I don't even know you. Now, that's what the book says. Now, we can say he means it. He said it. We understand it. We'll change our lives to submit to it. Or we won't. Now, Jesus showed the strength of that love and that he did it while we, that is, he loved us while we were wallowing in all manner of sin. This is what he said again to the church in Rome, in Romans 5, verses 6 through 10. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through his, the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And so God did for us what we never could do for ourselves when He sent Christ here to live a sinless life, though tempted in every point like as we are, yet without sin. Thus He's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world because when He uh, yielded His own body a sacrifice for us, it was a body that never knew sin. And when He shed His blood, it came from a body that never had sinned. And thus He could die on behalf of others and for nothing He did. And thus through the teaching of the gospel, my faith in Him and my obedient faith to his conditions to enjoy the salvation of sin that only Jesus can offer, I know that, but it still involves me believing the conditions and meeting the conditions and submitting to the conditions. And thus, he's the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him, Hebrews 5, 9. But now, while this tells us of the love of God, and we ought to rejoice in it, and we haven't preached the whole gospel of Christ until we preach it, it still involves teaching the truth about love and showing people what God's love really is and how we know He loves us. But there is the other side to that dollar bill. God is not going to let go of what is His. And we go to the Old Testament, to the writing of Moses, as he was inspired of the Holy Spirit to write this part of Scripture. Not long before the children of Israel to, grow in, to go into the land of promise and possess the land. Listen to this other side of God. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 23 through 26. Notice man's responsibility. The first thing he says, take Heed to yourselves. Why in this case? Lest you forget the covenant of the Lord your God which he made with you. And make for yourselves a carved image in the form of anything which the Lord our, uh, your God has forbidden you. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire. A jealous God. Now you know that didn't change and it hasn't changed. The writer of Hebrews makes it clear that if we turn away from the New Testament system of salvation, uh, our God to us is a consuming fire. Do you think he knew anything about this over in the Old Testament? When you begat children, listen to this, and grandchildren, and have grown old in the land, and act corruptly and make a carved image in the form of anything, and do evil in the sight of the Lord your God to provoke him to anger. Now listen to this. I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day. That you will soon utterly perish from the land which you cross over the Jordan to possess. You will not prolong your days in it. But will be utterly destroyed. Now let me ask you this. As you go through reading your Bible from the end of Joshua and Judges and so on. What is it that you read most often about the children of Israel? They knew this. They understood exactly what was said. How could you miss it? But what did they do? 
They ran after every idol that they could find over and over again. It took 70 years of Babylonian captivity to purge from them their desire to bow down to false gods. They were guilty of a lot of other sins after that. You can see that in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But they were never guilty again of idolatry. But look what it took. And they knew all along. God said this. He meant it. Did He? Yes. He said it. He meant what He said. Did you understand it? Yes. What did you do? We went on back out there and did exactly what you shouldn't. And what did He do about them in the land? He destroyed them off of it. Now this is the same God that Paul declares in Romans 5 and 6 through 10 that says, For when you were still without strength, the due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man some will even dare to die. But God demonstrates His own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Well, wasn't it the love of God and mercy of God and grace of God that developed Israel into a nation? All the way from the vague promise of Genesis 3.15 down through the promises uh, to Abraham that through his seed but all nations of the earth be blessed in uh, Genesis 12. Right on down to the development of a messianic family and in Egypt a messianic nation. And he leads them out of terrible bondage and gives them a law and guides them right on up until they enter the land of God. Now what did that? The hate of God or the love and mercy and grace of God? And yet he says, you must believe and do what I tell you. I am a jealous God. I will have no other gods before me. What do they do? Whoop! I'll go get the box of Cheerios. It's got a new taste to it now. And I just can't live until I get that taste. And that's what they did. Men haven't changed. Now you know that God wants everybody to be saved. God wants everybody on this earth to be saved. And the church is commissioned to preach the gospel, which is God's power to save them. Romans 1.16. And we dare not be ashamed of it, even as Paul was not ashamed of it. In 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 through 6, Paul says to this young preacher, Timothy, Therefore I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That was referenced in a prayer earlier today in this assembly. And then he says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. And salvation is offered to all men. Paul said to another young preacher in Titus 2.11, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. In other words, the way of salvation's there. It came first in Christ who declared He was the Savior. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me, John 14.6. But you know, what's available... What is offered is not always accepted. And as we studied last Sunday morning, the majority of people who have lived, are living, and will live, will reject the author of eternal salvation. In Matthew 7, 13 and 14, he tells us why. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction and many who go in by it well because narrow is the gate difficult is the way which lead to life and there are few that find it now that brings us to the other side then of the dollar bill in this case God is going to at a point out there in our future destroy eternally all those who reject him because he's a God of justice. And there's a day coming when perfect justice will be meted out to everybody. And if we haven't taken hold of the hand of salvation that extends to us the favor of God and the mercy of God through the gospel of Christ as we meet its conditions and comply with them on the day of judgment, listen, there's nothing but pure justice. And all of sin comes from the glory of God. 
And the wages of sin is death, Romans 3.23 and 6.23. Thus on that day, if we have not believed and obeyed the gospel and lived faithful in the Lord's church, then there is no hope. There is no mercy. You can cry for it all you want before the judgment bar of God. There will be none. Only pure, godly justice. In 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 and 9, to comfort Christians who were being persecuted, he tells us again about those who reject God. He says, and to you who are troubled, rest with us. In other words, the apostles want the members of the church to have the same rest that they have. Know this, he's saying. Understand this will happen. And conduct your life accordingly. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Now, why is that in your Bible? What are you expected to understand from that? And once you understand it, to order your life. How should you? It is first of all for the faithful to know that all those who have turned down the gospel call and thus the grace of God, that there's a day of retribution and it's coming. And you ought to rest in understanding that and not let hatred and anger and wanting to see vengeance uh, in those who maybe really deserve it. God's already said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And I don't think anybody can do that like God can. When you read what the Bible says about it. I don't have to worry about that. Somebody beats the law here and is guilty but is found innocent. He can't do that with God. So we shouldn't let these folks who are wicked people and who seemingly can get by with about anything bother us. We should work all we can to make a society that would not allow that to happen. But do you think that they get by with those wicked things with God? Not so. God's impartial. You know, he made a promise to bless all nations. He made that promise, I said earlier, to Abraham, Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3. Thus it was done through that descendant of Abraham, Genesis 22, 18. And Paul tells us in Galatians chapter 3, verses 14 through 16, that that very promise was fulfilled in Jesus Christ of Nazareth. It started with the limited commission while Christ was still on the earth to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and declare to them that the kingdom of heaven was at hand and to preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins, Mark 1 and verse 4. And you can see that further in Matthew 10, 6 through 7. Then, once the church was established, the great commission that was given by our Lord in Matthew's account of Matthew 28, 19 through 20, then it was for the whole world. Jew and Gentile alike. Thus salvation is offered to all men impartially. Rich, poor, young or old, whatever ethnic background, it's the same gospel for all. The terms of salvation are the same. They don't make any difference. In Ephesians 2, 11 through 16, Therefore remember that you once Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands that at the time you were without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise having no hope and without God in the world. But now, notice the location of salvation. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once afar off and been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity or hate, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. So everyone's saved, right? Wrong. Only those in the Lord's church 
And those of the Lord's church have heard the gospel and from the heart believed it and obeyed it. Romans 6, 17 and 18. Earlier in the chapter, Romans 6, 3 and 4. And they've lived faithful. They have met the terms of condition or the conditions of salvation that the Lord laid down. They've been saved and the Lord added the saved to the church. Acts 2 verse 47. He didn't leave anybody out either. Every saved person is in the Lord's church as you read of it in the New Testament. Acts 20 and verse 28 I think makes that very clear. Those who are ignorant or disobedient are going to be lost. We read that a moment ago in 2 Thessalonians 1, 8 and 9. God's impartiality does not mean He will accept all humans. Just won't do it. Another thing, God's intolerant. You know, Jesus was intolerant. I wish we knew the difference between long-suffering and intolerant, or tolerance. I wish we did. Jesus is intolerant of those who sinned or promoted sin. You find any place where Jesus was ever said, well, I know you're a sinner and you're doing this because it suits you and I know, you're, know that you're breaking God's will, but I'll be long-suffering with you. You can't find that in your Bible. It's sort of like people remembering George Washington on that dollar bill. They don't remember what's on the other side of it. You need to know all the Bible teaches on the subject before you form your view. Listen to his warning against the Pharisees and the Sadducees, Matthew 16, 6 through 8. Then Jesus said to them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And the disciples, being like a lot of disciples are, they reasoned among themselves saying, It's because we have taken no bread. You know, they weren't too bright a bunch at times. But Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, O ye of little faith, why do you reason among yourselves because you brought no bread? You silly outfits. Now that's my part. Well, that's what it says by implication. Verses 11 and 12. How is it you do not understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread? No, look, that's the Lord's own question. Why don't you understand? <laughs> don't you get it? But to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then, after you beat them over the head for a while, they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and Sadducees. I often think sometimes if it took that much from he who was perfect and the master teacher to get that over to folks, don't feel bad, David, in your own teaching. Now what was wrong with their doctrine? Read Matthew 23 and you'll know what was wrong with it. He calls them hypocrites, Matthew 23, 13 through 15, verse 23, verse 25, and 37 through 32. Sort of repeats himself, doesn't he? Guess he won't even understand. He calls them blind and fools, Matthew 23, 16 through 17, 19, 24, and 26. He calls them serpents and the generation of vipers, Matthew 23, 33. And they wouldn't see what others could, Matthew 11, 21 through 24. That's the other side of the dollar bill that says that on the other side is Jesus' love. Hey, that's as loving as you get right there. Not, not, there are not two lords here. They're the same. He just gives to one what they need as he gives to the other what that one needs. Let me ask you this. How would you think if I said, Alan, the Muslims are going to go into heaven ahead of you? How would you feel about that? Well, the Lord said things like that. He even said prostitutes are going to beat the Pharisee in heaven. What did he mean as a prostitute they would? No, he meant they were more open to hearing the truth of the gospel and willing to repent and obey it than any Pharisee or Sadducee ever thought about being. He told the Sadducees that they were ignorant. He told the Pharisees they put their doctrine above God's doctrine, Matthew 15, 3 through 9, and Matthew 22, 29. And by the way, guess who else was intolerant of false doctrine? The followers of Jesus. I wonder where they learned it. In Ephesians 5 and 11, Paul said, don't have any fellowship with sin. And you can just hear people say, yeah, but I have this son, or I have this wife, or I have this business partner, or I have this fine, upstanding friend. You get through with all that, and Ephesians 5 and 11 still says, don't have any fellowship with sin. Yeah, but don't have, what is there about don't have any fellowship with sin you don't understand? There were large dissensions in the Lord's church over doctrine itself. The very first one was an anti-doctrine, binding on people what God and His Word are not bound on them, and saying, you Gentiles can be saved by Christ, but you must be circumcised to keep the law. Now go back to Acts 15, 1 and 2, and see how long Paul and Barnabas put up with that. 
intolerant. In Galatians 2, 4 through 5, Paul talks about that. And this occurred because of false brethren secretly brought in who came in by stealth to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we did not yield submission even for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Sure beats the example I've seen of some folks. They're not only an hour, but a week and a month and a year, and we'll get around to it and we get around to it. Well, you're supposed to have Bible authority for that attitude. Where did you get it? From the Lord? And from his apostles? Consider their language, folks, and ask yourself if you've increased spiritually enough to use the language of spiritual things. In Acts 7, 51 through 52, Stephen to the Jews who would not believe said to them, You stiff-necked and uncircumcised and heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who were foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers. You think that's loving language? Well, if it's not, you take it up with God someday. It's in His Word. And you think about the caliber of Stephen. And I want to be where Stephen is right now. Do you? That means I must believe and act and do what Stephen did with the different people in the different conditions. In Acts 13, 10, Paul said to a man who was attempting to turn another person away from the gospel, O oh, full of all deceit and fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the right and straight ways of the Lord? If I were to say that to somebody who was in the same boat as this character was, most people would be mad at me. They wouldn't care this fellow's trying to stop another one from hearing the gospel that can save him. They just would say, you're harsh and mean and unloving and hateful and judgmental. Paul did it first, take it up with him. By the way, he wrote the great chapter on love in 1 Corinthians 13. In Acts 20 and 29, concerning corrupt elders. This is what Paul said. For I know this. What do you know? What do you absolutely know, and there's no doubt in it, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Now, if I were one of those elders, and he said that to me, what do you think I'm going to be looking for once Paul leaves? Ah, you know, Paul, he gets really beside himself over a lot of things. In James 4 and verse 4, even double-minded Christians were rebuked and people were warned about them. He said, adulterers and adulteresses, speaking spiritually, of course, do you know that friendship with the world is enmity or hate with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Why well, do you know if you're a friend of the world? Well, just don't do what you know he says. Very simple. And then you'll know you're a friend of the world. Truth does not have equal weight with sin. Christ and his followers do not tolerate that which opposes truth. Now, if you are, you better do some repenting in a hurry. He was confrontational. He confronted those who rejected the truth, that is, Jesus was, and so were his followers. And at times, listen, I don't think we understand this. At times, he purposely provoked the Pharisees, Luke 13, 10 through 17. Now, I want to read this. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years. And was bent over and could no way raise herself up. And when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said to her, Woman, you are loose from your infirmity. And he laid his hands on her. And immediately she was made straight and glorified God. Now watch. But the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation. Because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, and he said to the crowd, There are six days on which men ought to work. Therefore come and be healed on them, and not on the seventh day. I am pious. I know it, because I put it at the end of my name. The Lord then answered him. And the Lord was so nice to him. I mean, he was very tolerant, very understanding. And he answered him this way, Hypocrite! There's that judgmental harshness, meanness, and unloving coming out. And Jesus Christ himself does not each one of you on the Sabbath lose his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it away to water? So ought. Ought means a moral responsibility. So ought not this woman being a daughter of Abraham whom Satan has bound? Think of it. For 18 years be loose from the bond on the Sabbath. And when he had said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame. Well, they should be. 
And all the multitude rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. Would to God some people that are in the position of these people when they're rebuked today be put to shame. They don't seem to be made ashamed of anything, even when they know they're in violation of God's will. In 14, 1 through 6, now it happened as he went into the house of one of the rulers of the Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath, that they watched him closely. I wonder what they were watching closely for, to mimic him so they could live more like the Lord wanted them to live? And Jesus answering spoke to the lawyers and Pharisees saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? But they kept silent and he took him and healed him and let him go. Then he answered them saying, Talk about provoking folks. He wouldn't let them alone. He went after them. Does that tell us something about going after error that people teach and people who are noted for teaching the error? He said, which of you having a donkey or an ox that has fallen into a pit will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day? Well, they couldn't answer him regarding these things. Back in the days when the Bible was still the Word of God to a lot of folks, though they followed things contrary to it, back in the days when the church was more like these people, people stood up and challenged folks when they taught false doctrine. The neighbors dealt with people next door who taught false doctrine and said things to make them realize, hey, you're lost. We don't do that anymore, and I wonder why. In fact, after the Lord did all this, as a result, most of these people turned more solidly against him, John 5, 16 through 18. But listen, Jesus rocked the boat. And he rocked the boat hard. If you don't get that in reading this, then I don't know what to say. Jesus certainly wasn't afraid of confrontation. In John 8, 57 through 59, Then the Jews said to him, You are not yet 50 years old. and Have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, Before Abraham was, I am. Then they took up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Jesus' followers were also confrontational. The apostles were arrested, told to stop preaching about Jesus, Acts 4, 18 through 20. And you know what they told the judges? Okay. And they simply said no. They then went right back on with what they were doing in proclaiming Christ. They were arrested again, Acts 5, 27 through 33. Brethren, in all due respect, I do not believe there are many in the church who would do that today. Stephen's sermon in Acts 7 certainly wasn't gentle to his audience, Acts 7, 51 through 54. And even to the point of getting into an apostle's face, which Paul did, Galatians 2, 11 through 12, because that apostle had sinned and was to be blamed. They were confrontational. People won't listen unless sometimes it's very blunt, frank, and candid even then, in this case, as many of them didn't listen. They were also, Jesus was, exclusionary. Jesus excluded people by his teaching. In John 6, 60 through 66, the Bible says that some of his disciples considered what he taught a hard saying, and they turned back and walked no longer with him. He even used that to teach a lesson, turned to his apostles and said, Will you also go away? Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of everlasting life, and we know and are sure that thou art Son of God. His words offended people, but look at the people they offended. Jesus knew people would take offense, Matthew eleven six. He refused to do miracles in his own hometown because of the lack of belief, Matthew thirteen fifty five through 58. The disciples were shocked that he offended the Pharisees, Matthew 15, 12 through 14. Jesus let them know it didn't make him any difference. And it shouldn't to us. And later when they were converted, it didn't to them. This was all even prophesied about the Christ by Isaiah some 750 years before. Listen to Isaiah speaking of Christ along this very line in Isaiah 8, 14 and 15. He will be as a sanctuary, but a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel, as a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many among them shall stumble. They shall fall and be broken, be snared and taken. Well, one of the marks of Christ is that his own people would treat him this way once they heard the truth. Jesus' followers were also exclusive. Their teachings were rejected by Jews and Gentiles, and they did not compromise at all the truth to get them in. We've already seen that in Paul's comparison 
of the wisdom of this world and the wisdom of the gospel. We saw that as Paul explained it in 1 Corinthians 1, 23 and 28. Paul was not about to modify his teaching to ease offense. Galatians 5, 11 and 12. And I, brethren, he said, if I still preach circumcision, why do I still suffer persecution? Then the offense of the cross is ceased. I could wish that those who troubled you would even cut themselves off. Now that is sarcasm, folks. I'll tell you why. Because he's talking about those Judaizing teachers that says you Gentiles can be saved by Christ, but you must be circumcised. And that involves cutting. And he says the ones that need to be cut are these folks. That's exactly what he's doing. He's very plain. He's very blunt. Because it takes that with some people. I learned from 1 Corinthians 11 and 19 that heresies or factions will always be in the church. Now why? He tells us right there to try those to see who is really dedicated to God and who is not. I learned many years ago from passages like this that when problems come up and people choose ways other than God's will to settle them, I've learned something. I know somebody failed the test, and I'll never be toward that person again like I was before because I had to sit <laughs> by their fruits you shall know them. I've had to put a big red L at the top of the page. There's a distinction, 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 17. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship is righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part is a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore come ye out from among them and touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you. Indeed, God is love. God shows his love. But what people ignore is that God's love is conditional and that God is a God of justice. John 14, 21 says, God loves the obedient. And John chapter 10, 27 through 28 says, We're to follow the voice of Christ and that Jesus saves those who follow his voice. Well, the only thing that teaches me is, in view of the rest of what the Bible says, is that we must do what he said and the way he said it and for the reason he said it. That's proof of my love. Any other thing is not proof of one's love for God. If you need to obey the gospel, I hope you will today. Believe in Him, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, and be baptized for the remission of sin. As a child of God, if you've sinned, I trust in all humility, you will humbly repent of your sins, come confessing them. We'll pray with you and for you. God stands ready to forgive when you acknowledge His love and your obedience to His will. Will you come while we stand and sing?